So hi, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Rachel Murray. I'm the co-founder, co-CEO of She Geeks Out. Um, and for those of you who don't know who we are, we run um, cool, fun, happy events, now all in the cloud uh, for our lovely community of women in tech and tech adjacent roles. And we also offer corporate training on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, my role is primarily on the community side. So we are working very hard to um, bring a lot of uh, opportunity to our community, um, especially during this time. And and so I want to thank uh, the wonderful team at AWS for, um, for uh, sharing their wisdom around the work that they're doing. And we hope that you learn a lot. Please feel free to use the chat function on the bottom to ask questions. And then um, I think the team will take questions toward the end. And with that, I am going to let the team take over and I will uh, mute and hide myself. So if you need me, just find me on the chat. Thanks, Rachel. Rachel. Hi everyone, um, my name is Ron and welcome to um, our EFS webinar today. Uh, we're really excited to have an opportunity to talk a little bit about um, the team and what we do. So I have with me on my team, uh, or on our team, Chloe, uh, who will be talking a little bit more about her experiences and Sabita, who will be talking a lot about our culture at Amazon um, and opportunities. So. Uh, as I said, as Rachel mentioned, we are asking everyone to hold questions until the end. So uh, with that, let's get started. So um, quick agenda, we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Amazon EFS um, and how customers use it, um, which is something that's near and dear to my heart as a product manager here at Amazon EFS. Um, Chloe, one of our great systems uh, engineers, our development engineers will be talking about what it's like to work here. Um, and again, Savita will be talking about culture and innovation at Amazon and also um, and a little bit more about opportunities. So what is Amazon EFS? Before we get started, let me do a quick contextualization of what Amazon EFS is um, so that you kind of get the larger picture. So Amazon EFS with services that you might have heard of like S3, EC2, or SageMaker are one of 212 different services that make up Amazon Web Services or AWS. Um, and so we're one, of, one service in that group. Um, that includes products that are cloud-based uh, that do things like compute, storage, database, analytics, networking, mobile, uh, development tools, Internet of Things, security, enterprise applications, and more. Um, and so there's a lot of different services, and we really do help our customers in lots of different ways to uh, manage IT costs and scale. We're also trusted by large enterprises and some of the hard, hottest startups as well. So a variety of different options on what uh, we can do. Um, but yeah, so that's AWS. And AWS, along with products like Alexa, Amazon Prime, Kindle, I'm sure you guys have others that you have heard of before, um, all make up Amazon. And so we are one part of a larger organization, um, but our team is Amazon EFS. And I just wanted to make sure we talk a lot about that, um, but understand that we're part of the larger organization. So um, there's opportunities to learn within our service, but also, uh, within the other uh, product lines as well. So with that, let me quickly talk about Amazon EFS and just kind of almost define it for you. So Amazon EFS, Elastic File System, is a file storage system that allows you to use an Amazon uh, Elastic Compute Cloud, EC2, as you might uh, know it, instance to uh, create a simple interface that allows you to create and configure file systems. Basically have a file system in the cloud. Um, it is using something called NFS, which is Network File Systems, um, which is a very classic protocol that is used to interface with file systems um, for Linux-based workloads. We are, and we're unique in the sense that we are because we are a cloud native platform, um, we allow you to be in the cloud. Uh, we also are highly reliable and cost optimized. 
Um, so let me talk a little bit about what that actually means for us. So cloud native. One of the really cool things about Amazon EFS is that we're elastic. Um, it means that a customer doesn't actually need to figure out exactly how much storage they need to buy. Um, if you think about in the traditional way that you think about storage, you might need to buy physical hard drives or <laughs> storage. Um, and that's a machine that you have to have come on to your um, data center or whatever that might look like. We're elastic and we take care of that so we can uh, grow and shrink on demand. Uh, you don't have to say you need one gigabyte today and two te terabytes tomorrow. We'll grow and shrink for you. Uh, we'll also help customers scale. We can go up to petabytes um, really quite e easily. And we're also integrated. So we have a lot of other um, so, um, services that we integrate with, but we also work with on-premises applications and um, things like that. Second thing is we're highly reliable. So one of the biggest tenets of our service is that we are available and durable um, and we are secure. And that means a lot of really cool and interesting problems we get to work on and solve for our customers. But it also means for our customers, they don't have to worry about whether or not their file system is going to be available. We'll do that for you with a 99.99% SLA, which is really, really cool. Um, and the last bit is that we're also cost optimized. Um, and this is a big one for a lot of our customers because there's no minimum commitments or upfront fees. So if you're working on a startup, you don't have to put in all the capital to buy all of the uh, SSD drives that you need. Um, on the flip side, we also work with larger companies that have a lot of storage need uh, or a lot of storage and work with them to create uh, lifecycle management. Um, which allows you to basically put some of the files that you've stored into colder storage. And so we're allowing you to be cost optimized as well um, at both sides of the scale. So as I kind of alluded to, Amazon EFS is a part of the AWS ecosystem. And so what that means is we're a global service currently available in 22 regions that you can see on the slide, which means that no matter where your EC2 instances are, where your users are, where your product is, your customers. We're there to be able to help you launch your applications um, or your workloads and access our file systems anywhere. And it doesn't mean that you have to be in these locations, it just means that we are for you. Um, and I think that that's a really cool thing about a product um, and something that's very unique to something that AWS does, which is allow people to have access to um, files anywhere. Uh, one of the other really interesting things about working in the uh, Amazon and AWS ecosystem is that we're also a part of this ecosystem and a part of the 212 different services that AWS currently offers. And so what that means is that we are uh, integrated in with these different services and more coming soon. Um, so what that for a customer, they are able to use us with Amazon ECS, EKS, or Fargate to attach um, EFS as the storage, shared storage behind containers. Um, or you can also use EFS as the data source for a SageMaker notebook that's training new machine learning models. So there's a lot of different ways that our customers can actually use EFS with our other services, um, which really allows us to be a versatile, different, um, versatile use case for a lot of customers. And so kind of on that note, who uses EFS? Um, who are, who, wh why does it matter? Um, and who are our customers? So there's a lot of different use cases. So as I mentioned, we have those integrations, we're available everywhere. We have all those different features. And so what that means is we can really support a lot of different use cases, um, home directories or uh, content management, database backups, analytics, just to name a few. And we really work hard to make sure that we are capable of working with metadata intensive jobs. So things that need low latencies and have really serial I, uh, IO, but we can also work with more uh, scaled out jobs and work at the scale that you would imagine um, with such a global large service. 
here are just a few of those customers that are taking advantage of that. So um, one of the use cases I talked about was database backups. And so um, Cisco, JD Power are some of our kind of bigger names that you might have heard of uh, that do that. And they typically use us because we're elastic and simple. So um, we use protocols that they're already used to with their old uh, systems and they are able to just spin up new uh, spin up new file systems and just get going. Um, there's lots of others um, names on here, but and I'm sure you probably recognize a few. Uh, but without getting into every single detail, I'll just keep going and talk specifically about one use case, which is Celgene. Um, so Celgene is a really interesting use case because they're a biopharmacal pharmaceutical company, and what they're doing is they're analyzing. Um, their data to see if they can find uh, new ther drug therapies for cancer and inflammatory diseases. And so this is a direct quote from the customer, uh, but I think what's really cool about it is basically we are the managed file system for them. And so as Amazon EFS, we allow Celgene to concentrate on figuring out how to come up with those drug therapies. Um, and we'll take care of managing their file systems and if they have more intensive analysis that they need to do, we will handle that for them, which really frees up their resources and their, um, their IT teams to figure out things that are more in their wheelhouse, which are around the biopharmaceutical uh, aspect of their analysis and um, their processing. And I think so that's a customer that's really interesting. Um, and there's a lot more about them on, on the, our website. But I think the other thing that is really interesting to think about when we talk about products is um, why does it matter? Like, it's cool that one customer used it well, but is that it? Um, and I think a clear example of one thing that, uh, or one example of why that's not the case is um, we recently launched an integration with Fargate, which is an AWS container solution. And basically, people were really excited. Uh, um, I love tweets just because it's a quick way to get the pulse of people who are using your product. Um, and in this tweet, uh, underneath it, the, this customer is basically saying, you fixed every problem I had with the service and were gracious enough to overlook my insulting messages at the time, which I think is just a really fun and cool way of saying, hey, you solved a problem uh, that I had and it works. And that's not the only tweet that that was from that launch. And that was a launch that happened April 8th, so just a month ago. Um, and this happens all the time. So we're just working on really cool problems um, and solving something really big for our customers. And so kind of with that, I think um, I wanna hand this off to Chloe to talk a little bit about what it's like to work on a really interesting service like this that scales and delivers such value to our customers. Thanks, Ron. Um, my name is Chloe Lopez. Um, I am a senior systems development engineer uh, with the EFS team. Um, so what does system development engineer mean? Um, most uh, engineers at uh, uh, AWS and at Amazon have the title of software development engineer. A systems development engineer is like a software development engineer, and we uh, definitely are ex uh, expected to have the same coding chops as a development, uh, software development engineer. Uh, but a systems development engineer has um, uh, uh, an area of expertise that is in the systems engineering uh, area. Um, and that can mean a lot of different things. We're a very diverse group. Um, we can be embedded systems engineers, we can be DevOps engineers, we can specialize in uh, high availability operations and operational excellence. Uh, we can specialize in systems engineering and systems administration, low level uh, Linux or Unix debugging, um, systems debugging, even robotics. Um, so there are, this community is, is a very uh, diverse community, um, and there's lots of different ways to share those kinds of expertise. Um, and I think that's true of our uh, software development engineers as well. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I ended up at Amazon, because sometimes 
but you know, there's maybe a perception that with a big company like this, you have to have been a, a hotshot uh, Silicon Valley type person your whole career. And I just want to show you that that's not true. There are a lot of paths here. Um, I started out um, my very first Unix systems type job was actually being a telescope operator um, in the middle of the night at a research institution. Um, and I moved out from there. I started to work at other research in institutions and I really thought that I was going to have a, a sort of a, a academic or a, a nonprofit sort of orientation for a long time. Um, but not so long ago, I actually uh, took an industry job, a private sector job at a web startup that was just getting to the point where it was getting ready to be sold. Um, and that was my first experience with industry, gave me some experience with um, operating at web scale, um, having customers um, all over the country. Um, and then once that startup was uh, purchased by a large corporation, I got to experience the corporate, the big time corporate industry as well. And you'll see a little later on, um, uh, I, I can compare what the experience of all of those is to uh, what the experience is in EFS. Um, so if you are wondering how it can compare, if you're one of these, it's like, oh yeah, I do that kind of thing, then you, you can see what the, what's the same and what's the difference. But my, the point I wanna get across to you is that there isn't just one way to become uh, an engineer. Um, there are many different ways um, and uh, Amazon and AWS, we really support that kind of growth. Um, so next I'll talk a little bit about sort of the technical perspective. What is it, what does the technology, what are kind of problems do we solve um, at AWS and at EFS? Um, so we'll start with sort of the AWS why um, perspective. So we saw on Ron's slide, the, the world map. Um, there are many, many sites that we operate in. Everything has to work at a global scale, right? We, there are no, no, we have high operational standards. There are no maintenance windows where everything has to be available all the time because our timeframes are global, right? So that moment where you think at, at the moment of design, at the moment of, of before you've even written a line of code, these things have to be designed in and it's a really interesting uh, and satisfying problem to solve. Um, uh, everything is CI, CD. We have build automation. We can't do manual deployments. Doing manual deployments at that kind of level. Um, uh, I saw a tweet today. Somebody saying, "Well, you know, have you ever d done a deployment by SSHing to a box and doing a git pull?" Right? That doesn't scale. There's there's high quality tooling um, to support uh, this kind of large scale deployment, large scale operations. Um, and there are many services available within Amazon. Um, Many of them are available to customers and they are high quality and we have the ability to leverage those services as well. Um, so there's this, it's a, an amazing opportunity to sort of uh, work at this very high level, this very abstract level, a, a situation where architecture really matters and you're encouraged to think about architecture. Um, there, because the tooling is high quality, there's a lot less undifferentiated work. You know, that experience they say, oh, now we have to implement logging. Now we have to imp implement metrics. Now we have to implement um, uh, the operational process, the deployment process. Oh, I have to set up Jenkins again. Those kinds of experiences. Th these things are available. They just work. They work at a very high quality level. Um, I will say that because Amazon is as big as it is, because we have these standards, um, a lot of times we have in-house tooling that you may not have seen before. We have peculiar practices that solve the problems that we want to solve and that we need to solve. Um, peculiar is a word that Amazon uses for itself a lot. Um, so that's why I highlight it here. Um, and I find it very interesting to learn. So why do they do these things in this different way? Um, and, and satisfying to learn that the answers are, are, are grounded in um, some really thoughtful decisions. So as far as technical perspectives of EFS, um, when I arrived at EFS, I come, was coming from that large company and I thought uh, everybody, we were in the middle of, of doing a lot of transitions of our services to AWS and the, word, every, the thing everyone was saying was 
well, you know, blob storage is the only cloud storage. That's just what storage is in the cloud. You make put things in S3 and you pull things from S3. Um, and I have been done some work in the sort of the storage data center storage management space. Um, and I knew that that can't be the whole story. Pulling a gigantic file from, from the cloud every single time you want to do an operation, that doesn't seem right. Files are very native to, to Unix. It's the metaphor of Unix. Surely there's some other way to do it. Um, and when I found out about EFS, I, I, just, I just saw that possibility. It was so exciting to say that, hey, maybe you can actually do files in the cloud. File, because files are in every operating system. Files are in every language. It's a very easy, very simple, um, well understood metaphor. Um, but how? Right? This is the question. Um, I don't know if, if you've had any experience with doing storage management. Um, I'll start with these bottom ones where, you know, the custom, the management aspect of it, you know, migrating volumes, um, you know, running out of inodes, um, raid management, raid groups, that kind of thing. Oh, now we have to migrate from one piece of hardware to another piece of hardware. It's a never ending problem, right? And yet EFS solves all of those problems. Um, and the storage is essentially unlimited. And you get on these boxes and you, if you've mounted this, this NFS volume, you do a DF, it's literally max int is what you see for free storage, right? It's um, really amazing. And, and there's no, it scales automatically. You don't have to think about, oh, I'm about to run out, I need to do something. Um, the availability and durability promises. Um, if you're not familiar with with AWS, um, the the systems are distributed in sort of virtual logical data centers called availability zones. Um, and so, for our customers, when they want to have availability, they'll run their service in more than one availability zone. Um, that way, if one availability zone has a problem, they can continue operating in the other availability zone. Well, we have to meet our customers there. But if you think about it it's essentially a distributed file or distributed file system across geographically separate entities, right? How do we do consistency um, in that situation? How do we maintain durability? You know, if one of these uh, availability zones falls off of the planet, how do we make sure that all of the data is, is, is there and it is completely um, always available and safe? Right? These are really interesting, really challenging problems, very abstract problems too. Um, so yeah, that's, these are the, the, the exciting aspects, technical aspects. Um, and you can think about sort of um, what, the, the, what kind of solutions might be, how hard that might be, and how uh, uh, no, the novel solutions that might be involved there. So very exciting. Um, so what kind of skills do we need? Well, it turns out uh, we need all kinds of skills. Um, uh, we're a little bit different, I think, from some services um, within AWS. And also when you think about your typical um, you know, company that has a service, or, you, know, you have this maybe web oriented, it's got a database somewhere. Um, we're a storage service. We do low level systems programming um, in order to, for performance reasons or for, for um, you know, handling storage at the storage level because we are literally moving, you know, bytes around and holding responsibility for those bytes. Um, we are implementing protocols um, that are open source, widely supported, you know, have to uh, handle all kinds of use cases, right? So we have to be able to do deep dives on that. It's not just HTTP, right? Um, so we support NFS now and there are other protocols um, that our, our engineers have to deal with as well. Um, storage related algorithms. If you have expertise in the storage space, um, obviously that's definitely something that we use all the time. We have uh, subject matter experts um, in those areas. Um, caching in a file system sort of, situation. caching is always hard, right? But caching at, at the NFS level, um, improving performance, um, all of the problems associated with that are very, very interesting. Um, when you're talking about a file system. Um, and performance tuning, obviously performance is always the name of the game uh, when it comes to file access. You can never be fast enough. So we're always trying to drive that down and it's very 
very challenging question. Um, and additional skills that we that we uh, follow that we need to use um, to manage this. Um, obviously, distributed systems. Any experiences with distributed systems? Um, you know, uh, there's a, a an old Unix joke about the, the distributed systems. You know, I have no tools because I broke my tools with my tools. Right? It's the problem solving in a distributed space system space is extremely interesting. Um, capacity management. You know. Somebody's, we're doing that for the customer, right? And we have to solve that in a general way for all of our customers simultaneously. Very interesting question, very uh, interesting problem. Um, we also, of course, do uh, data science on sort of our file system access, maybe thinking about, you know, well, how can we predict capacity usage or how can we predict systems optimization or these kinds of things. Um, and finally, operations is, is very key always. Um, and uh, the DevOps deployment angle, um, you know, we have special requirements for our deployments, right? Because we are a storage service and we have these, we can't just, you know, kick all the servers, right? We, we have to be very careful about how we do deployments. Huge opportunities for people who have Dev, DevOps and um, uh, build automation backgrounds. So, as far as what it's like to be at AWS and how, to be at EFS. Um, as I think as I said earlier, we're to think as big as possible. And from a technical point of view, that means architecture really matters. Um, I don't know, I've definitely had times in my career when I was just like, I, I have dreams of a bigger architecture, right? I have dreams of scale, I have dreams of abstraction, you know, but maybe the resources aren't there. Here it's a requirement, you have to be able to, to uh, have those conversations. Um, we're thinking about customers all the time. We are, every every technical decision comes down to what's the experience for the customer. Um, and in some ways, I don't know, if you've ever had the experience of, you know, somebody wants you to, you know, just, just ship it and to get it to customers as quickly as possible. You know, maybe that doesn't sound like the greatest thing, but the way it works at AWS is, that means security is job one. It's job zero, actually, is, is what they say. Security is job zero. Um, availability is job zero. Um, the customer experience, all of these things factor in the customer experience. And it makes for a good technical decision, um, carefully considered um, to start with, which is what we all want. Um, the we do design reviews, right, in order to facilitate this decision making process. Get really have get a, a bunch of experts together, have these conversations, right? Um, the opportunity to do that is one of the things I really love about working at AWS. Um, and we definitely move fast. Um, and that, the way that works for us is, you know, we don't, if you've ever worked at a really large corporation where it's like, well, the wheels turn slowly, Amazon doesn't feel like a large corporation in that way. Uh, we have a lot of op autonomy and we have a lot of um, uh, ability to sort of control our own destiny um, so that we can get these changes out as quickly as we can to get features to our uh, uh, customers as quickly as I can. And I've seen you know, major features go from a developer's you know, sprint review demo to a worldwide launch in six months. Um, and I think all of the, the conversations and architectural thoughts that we have really are what make that possible. One of the, the things that I think is really, you know, I, I'm really happy to see um, is that even though it's very high paced, uh, fast paced environment, um, it's safe to learn from mistakes. You're, we're expected to make mistakes. We're expected to fail. There are situations where, um, you know, the, the decisions have a higher uh, uh, importance. And uh, uh, Savita will talk a little bit about the one-way door idea later, um, where we really try hard to make sure that we are making the right decision. Um, but sometimes it's just easier, let's try it and see. Um, uh, and when it comes to sort of operational uh, issues and things like that, Right, we'll do the review. There's no blame involved. Um, 
we all just want to know how can we do it better. Um, and it's really a wonderful atmosphere in that regard. Um, you know, the, because we prioritize architecture, you know, security, scalability, operability, all of these things, they're just part of what we do. Um, we don't have to convince anyone that it's a good idea um, as engineers. Um, uh, our teams have autonomy, right? Autonomy is very pri prized and the ability to move quickly is very prized. So we end up in small teams and we work uh, hard together and there's a lot of close collaboration and camaraderie, uh, which is wonderful. Um, and I learn from people every day at AWS. Um, that is really a dream come true for me. So, yeah, so we, we are a big company that feels like a startup. Um, I think that is really true. Um, even the, the large, the sort of like adolescent startup that I used to work at um, feels bigger than our day to day at uh, EFS because we have the autonomy that we are allowed um, and expect that's what expect is expected of us. Um, policy doesn't get in the way. We have rigorous policies. We have rigorous security, um, probably as rigorous as I have ever seen. Um, but it's not security theater and it doesn't impede you from getting your work done. Um, it all makes sense. Um, we don't, we have this idea, uh, that's phrase that we throw around at Amazon sometimes called good intentions, right? We don't just pe expect people to be good by trying really hard, right? To being as conscientious as possible, especially in the operational space, right? If there's a system that is failing, it's a system that's failing. Um, so we create processes that um, enforce or create or uh, implement our standards of quality um, so that we're not expecting everyone to be perfect all the time. And that's really bar raising in terms of, of uh, what operational excellence looks like. Um, in terms of career development, um, we have a really big picture view at AWS. Um, we expect that people will contribute to all parts of the company. Um, and just because you work at EFS today doesn't necessarily mean you'll be working at EFS five years from now. Um, just because you're doing a particular role today uh, doesn't mean you'll be doing exactly that kind of role or that exactly that kind of technology. Uh, we expect people to grow and learn. Um, and there are opportunities everywhere to, to do those things. Um, so um, it's really wide open um, uh, in that way. Um, and that's something that is really exciting. And, and, and the, another thing too is that you know, different teams are at different levels of development. Some are starting brand new services. Some are very well established services. Um, you know, if one of those works better for you, you can find a place that works better for you. So um, the other thing I just want to throw out there is that um, at EFS specifically, you know, we have a team of systems engineers not just systems development and engineers. And this is something that's very dear to my heart because it is something that I tried to find for a long time because I did start as a systems engineer. Um, systems engineers maybe not, don't have the same coding background as a software engineer or a systems development engineer does. Um, but we are really investing in growing people who are interested, uh, systems have a systems engineering background but are interested in growing their coding skills um, and follow that career path. Um, which I just think is wonderful. I've definitely uh, known systems engineers at other places who are just felt blocked. They didn't know how to move forward. Um, so that is something that I'm really glad to see. Um, and finally, the workforce is about as diverse as I have uh, ever experienced. I did have, not long after I started, so I've been at AWS for about three years now. Um, not long after I started, I was in a meeting um, of senior engineers that was 50% women, um, which was not an experience that I had had anywhere else. Um, so that was, hey, that's, this is a, this feels good. So, yeah, so that's uh, uh, all I have to say about uh, the sort of experience. We can definitely talk about more about it later, but I'll hand off to Savita now. Yeah, hi. So my name is Savita, Savita Belgaukar. I'm uh, one of the software development engineers, software development managers at uh, Elastic File System. 
And um, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Ran, for sharing the, the Elastic File System, the product and the customer experiences, as well as thank you, Chloe, for sharing your career path here. Um, so I'm going to be switching gears now and shedding some light on our peculiar Amazon culture of innovation today. So first things first, I'm going to start with our mission. So we at Amazon, the company mission is to be Earth's most customer centric company. And as you can see, it's a very, very broad mission. It has nothing to do with selling cloud or selling e-commerce or selling books online, right? It doesn't talk about any specific geography or technology or any industry for that matter. But as this mission is broad, it's also very, very specific because the tie-breaking question at Amazon is always, what is it that's best for our customers? So how do we do that, right? Now, one of the, the key element is our failures, learning from our failures. As you can see on the screen, our CEO, very proud to show off one of the biggest failures at Amazon, which was the Fire Phone. And the reason being the learnings that come from these failures bring in a lot bigger and, and broader impact on our culture. In fact, Jeff openly shares his view that, that our failures need to grow as we grow as a company. So if you think about it, if you want to innovate, you got to, to experiment. And if you're experimenting, then you've got, got to have some failures on, on the way before you actually succeed. So your thought process must be going, how do we actually manage that in real life, right? So next I'm gonna show you an inside peek on our DNA. So Amazon's uh, culture actually is based on these 14 leadership principles. All of these are, are really ingrained in every Amazonian. As you can see, we start with the customer obsession and end with Re delivering results. Idea being, if you really focus on customers and do everything that's right along the way, then the results are gonna come automatically. Every Amazonian is a leader in our mission. So it's not like we have leaders and we have developers, right? Um, everyone is expected, everyone is supposed to own the space and the area that they work with. You must be wondering why do we have so many of the leadership principles? Um, reason being leaders are multidimensional. Uh, depending on the context, it may make sense to apply bias for action as opposed to insisting on higher standards, for example. So we empower our, our, our leaders to actually use their superpowers when they operate. This is really, really the core of how Amazon innovates how leadership leads and how we keep the customer obsession going within every level of the company. And um, it's definitely the way we actually hire. It's the way leadership is principles is how we actually promote people within the organization. And it's like a common language essentially. And um, there are like so many different different um, elements of these leadership principles that apply in our regular life as well, besides the, the corporate life. So I would definitely encourage every one of you to actually check these out in, in detail. One of the interesting one I'm gonna talk a little more about today is our leaders are right a lot. Um, actually, most often we are, we are right, as in leaders cannot always be right but we can be right more often. And, um, but most people have a tendency to actually look for, for evidence that confirms their own beliefs, as opposed to actively seeking data that disconfirms their own belief, which actually broadens your perspective if you think about it a little deeper. And that actually gives you an ability to see multiple viewpoints and have much higher chances and, of succeeding. So uh, next, 
the way we execute on those leadership principles is by having a lot of mechanisms in place. We talk a lot about intentions versus mechanisms with Amazon. And um, we have very unique way of doing things. So working backwards is a process as you see on the screen today. Essentially, most of the companies, what they do, they develop the product. And when the product is, all, is ready, then they actually approach marketing, they write press release and create a lot of buzz, right? Does that sound right? But that's not what we do at Amazon. At Amazon, we always start with the customer because that's what matters the most. So we always start with the customers. We do something called a press release, an internal press release. We don't, of course, publish that. But this forces everyone to actually dive deep into what the customer needs are. And it also forces them to ask questions that our customers would ask or our partners or any relevant parties would. So that is what we call the PRFAQ. And with this, we actually start designing the solutions then, because this definitely uses, you, you gives us the, the clarity that we want to do the work towards. So next, there are, these are some of the questions that we actually work through um, while we are doing this press release process or, or working, working backwards process, working backwards because that's how it is for other companies. Um, but not for us. So as you can see, in, along every, every step, essentially, we never take our eyes off of our customers and the experiences that we provide for them. So um, next, while we are going through these uh, decision-making processes, there is one question, a very critical question that guides us, which is, is it a one-way door or is it a two-way door? As in the decisions that we will be taking today or at the time, can those be changed? Are those reversible, right? So based on what the answer to that question is, we decide how much extensive study we need to put or how much time and effort we need to put in before making those. There are some decisions which are irreversible, right? Like when you publish an API, API is a contract. So if there's no way going backwards. We got to complete, continue to support compatibility and so on. So decisions like that would definitely need longer and, and have, have heavier studies need to be done. But because in, in business, speed matters. So we always look for bias for action if there is a calculated risk taking, and especially if it's a two-way door. So no matter how big or how small your team is within Amazon, there is this, these, some of the elements that I just shared, which are part of the, our, our startup culture. So um, those were some of my tidbits that I shared about the peculiar culture at Amazon. So I bet all of you want to be a proud Amazonian at this point. So I'm gonna share some of the opportunities that we have open and these are the positions that are around 25 positions open and different roles, as you can see, we are looking for talented product managers, experienced software engineers, as well as system engineers. Um, we're also looking for development managers and UX designer. Uh, I have Joe here. Yes, they're all in the Boston area. And I'm actually joined with Joe uh, from recruiting. Um, so actually, can you share the next slide? Yeah, so you can see Joe's uh, contact information is here. We also have more uh, resources on our site. And as I mentioned, um, if you don't, even if you don't check out the roles in EFS, I would definitely strongly encourage you to look at our 14 leadership principles for your personal growth as well. But having said that, I want to open up this floor for questions. What questions do we have today?
So in, in going back to Rachel's question, they are Boston area. They, they all are in Boston. We have an office in Seaport. Of course, everybody's working from home remotely right now. Uh, but these positions are based from the Boston area. I see more questions coming. Uh, how about remote work? Yes, everybody's working remotely. And yes, we do have lots of employees working at least partially remote for EFS. And what's the culture like now with remote work? So Chloe actually mentioned uh, some the internal tooling. We actually have Amazon Chime as, as our, our, we don't use Zoom in Amazon, we use Chime, uh, but that, that's a really great, great product that we are currently enjoying uh, to have these you know, virtual meetings and, and uh, we even do Chime parties every week essentially. Um, how is Chime different? Chime is uh, actually HIPAA compliant. So they are going to go create uh, mm -hmm. virtual meds or, or doctor's visits using Chime. But Chime is highly secure, my point being. And, and um, it's, it definitely is along the lines of the quality and the, the, the scale that Chloe was referring to. Um, yeah, Chime is also our, our uh, uh, internal chat network as well. So our online chats all happen through Chime. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it serves a lot of different things. Um, it's fully integrated with all one of the, so this is this is one of the things that I just just always tickles me. Um, so we it's fully integrated with our co conferences room. Uh, we also have uh, Alexa in our conference room. So you can walk in and you can say Alexa start my meeting. And it um, oops, I activated my Alexa over here. And it just opens this time and it connects everybody. And I think that's great. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, I would say, you know, we had a meeting with our senior engineers and we talked about like, so how are things different now that we are um, all working from home? And the number of commits has gone up. Um, uh, I think there are some things we were very used to working on via Chime. Um, we work with people in Seattle via Chime a lot. Um, so I think it was really natural for us. Um, it was very smooth in that regard. Right. Are there any Elastic File System product related questions today? Or what it means to be a product manager on Amazon or EFS? Culture question. Stop sharing. what's the best way to get experience with Amazon Elastic file system? Um, so I guess one thing is I shared the um, URL for Amazon EFS. And so if you want to get started, you can go. We have a really good uh, quick guide on getting started with that. Um, that being said, I will also say that a lot of us who join EFS don't necessarily have file system experience. Um, and so once you join, you might just get to learn a lot about file systems over the course of a couple of weeks. Um, and so that's also, uh, you don't necessarily need to be an expert on it, um, but having some expertise in some, one of, one of the areas that Chloe mentioned earlier is great, so. Um. Yeah, definitely. I guess I would add on, on, on to that too, is that, you know, because we handle so much for the customer, the part that the customer sees is actually really simple, right? We, you create a file system, you create um, mount points for your, your file system. Uh, maybe you, you set the performance profile. There aren't a lot of knobs to turn. Um, so um, sort of definitely go and, and click around in the console on, on the AWS and, and you, know, you can create a file system and see what that experience is like. There's the stuff that is on the, the submerged part of the iceberg is a completely different story and it's very you, you don't necessarily need to, to be an expert in AWS um, to, to sort of get into all of that stuff, so. Um, so I hear, I see, are we working on any open source projects at EFS? There are a lot of open source projects that we use, but are we participating under EFS? 
right now nothing na, nothing na undergoing but we definitely have something planned for future um, and then there was a question about the day-to-day -day of being a PM um, at AWS. And so the one thing I will say is because we are as customer driven as we are, um, I probably will say that I spend a lot of time either on customer calls or trying to get FaceTime with customers to talk about um, projects we're working on. Um, there is also a lot of coordination with other teams and things like that. So um, my day also probably spends a good amount of time uh, interfacing with folks who are based out of Seattle or um, just other places. Um, and I guess maybe the last thing that usually happens in my day to day is obviously uh, working with these guys, um, spending a lot of time with our engineering teams and just making sure that we're, everyone is on the same page about what we're building and why. Um, I think a lot of what the PM role at Amazon and AWS is, is about making sure that we're really crisp about what the customer need is. Um, and so just being able to articulate that is just very important. Yeah, another thing I would add, um, and I constantly challenge around is that when the Scrum teams that she supports that I work directly with her, that, that you know, do you have the data to say with the, the, the things that you're claiming? It's not just you, but in general, because Amazon is such a data-driven company that, that part of the PM role is really constantly looking through and providing data points as we make the decisions for every team. Yeah, definitely. Um, I actually have worked with both Savita and Chloe on various different projects, so it's actually been great. Uh, what is your favorite things or work or non-related, non-work related about working within AWS? I, I feel like for me, for me, the best part is the impact that that my work brings. I think that that's the most favorite for, part for me, and 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 the scale. So those are the two things that, that that's the reason why I joined AWS was that that the fact that you know the 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 day to day work that I'm doing may seem not as a big deal, but if you think about it from the, how the world consumes it, so everybody uses Netflix, for example. Everybody uses phones, and, and you know a, a lot of uh, things that we do actually get consumed by people on a regular basis, basically. So that that's my favorite thing. John, or... for me, I, mean, I think for me, it, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say this is always what happens with Zoom calls. Um, so I think one of the things I really enjoy about being at AWS is also just working with a lot of really smart people. Um, and having to build something that I think in other companies I've worked at before, we've been working to solve problems. Um, but for the most part, there would be another company that did something similar. Um, and here we really are tackling problems that not many other places are going to be tackling. Um, the scale of things, um, the size of, of issues, um, working with other working with an organization where half of the team or ha most of the other teams aren't based out of Boston. Um, it's just problems that you don't necessarily end up thinking about, but there are really smart people who are on the other end of it. And so um, it's a really challenging problem, but it's also, there are people who are just really willing to help. And so I think that's really great. Sorry, Chloe. I would say that, you know, the thing, no, you also stole my answer. So I had to think of a different answer, but um, <laughs> uh, I think I would, the thing that I, one other thing that I would say is um, uh, there, there aren't like hard roles that you have to like sort of stay in your lane, right? Mm -hmm. Being curious is one of our leadership principles. And if you, if there's a, a if you, come across a problem when you're trying to solve one problem and you come across a thread that you want to pull on and you want to learn about that area and see how it relates to the problem that you're working working on you can do that you can uh, you have that flexibility um, to dive deep on these things when you didn't necessarily think you know um, uh, weren't necessarily thinking of it in in those terms I um, mean you may end up changing like the whole architecture or approach that your team is taking by following those things you're really encouraged to do that. Um, uh, there aren't, it's, it's not about, um, you know, oh, whose toes are you going to step on, right? 
you make the case, you collect the data, and, and hey, you learn something, and you can teach the rest of the team. You know, that's it really encouraged. Um, so that's, you know, when you combine that with, like, so many people, wonderful people to learn from, it's just so stimulating um, and rewarding. Okay. All right. So thank you, everybody. Really, really appreciate it. and looking forward to um, having more, more of you interested in looking at our, our roles, basically. Yeah. Maybe having someone join. Yeah. That would be cool. Um, thank you yeah, all. Great. Yeah, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. This was really interesting. And what we'll be doing is we'll be making this uh, available. Um, so we'll be sharing it out and along with all those great links. And um, yeah, thank you, everybody. All right. Bye.